This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. South Africa is one of the most industrialized countries on the continent, and yet not far from the hustle and bustle of metropolitan centers such as Johannesburg, Durban, and Cape Town, underdeveloped rural communities, deprived of their lands by the former apartheid government, continue to struggle for a better life. The end of apartheid ushered in new hope, and as Nelson Mandela said in 1995, with freedom and democracy came restoration of the right to land, and with it the opportunity to address the effects of centuries of dispossession and denial. And yet, more than two decades later, South Africa's rural communities remain underdeveloped, and many of the reclaimed farms have failed. So, what is the way forward? Could it be a new sustainable development model rooted in conservation? And can black South Africans overcome the injustices of conservation's colonial origins to embrace the concept and make it their own? I am Liu Feifei. Welcome to Talk Africa. The Gumbi tribe of northern KwaZulu Natal have found a new way to utilize reclaimed lands for community development. Here's a glimpse of the journey they've undertaken. Let's have a look. In the northern part of KwaZulu Natal province in South Africa lies the Samkanda Community Game Reserve. It covers 12,000 hectares, and once this fell under the control of the apartheid regime in the 1960s. Samkanda, however, is now back in the hands of its indigenous occupants, the Gumbi community, a sub-tribe of the larger Zulu community. Samkanda's repatriation was formalized in 2005, following the fall of the apartheid regime in 1994 and the onset of land reforms and the subsequent land reclamation petitions. The Gumbi community were among the first to file these petitions and they regained their land relatively early. For much of South Africa, however, attempts to equitably redistribute this resource remains contentious but ongoing. For the Gumbi people, a new opportunity then presented itself as they explored ways of turning their newly regained lands into commercially viable assets. While the terrain was not conducive for farming, the land was home to a rich diversity of wildlife. Samkanda also fell under a key conservation corridor between the Zululand Rhino Reserve and the Pongola Game Reserve, home to the endangered black rhino and wild dog. In partnership with the Wildlands Conservation Trust and the Worldwide Fund for Nature, the community established a conservancy and then created a consolidated game reserve that could be used as an economic engine to drive developments in the community. Various development projects have since been derived from these partnerships to ensure that some kind of game reserve is sustained by the community. This includes training of the community members in climate smart small scale agriculture, including palmaculture, which emphasizes vegetable propagation without pesticides and artificial fertilizers under low rainfall conditions. So the vision is to turn this into a community training center in a way. So we'll take the community, we'll put, uh, bring them here, and then they can see what's possible in their uh, communities. So in terms of what they can plant and how to plant all of, all of those crops. So the idea is to have each household having a garden that they are producing in, in their own space. So the vision is one home, one garden, basically, across the Kumbi hub. There's also education on financial literacy and business development skills. 40 emerging entrepreneurs are also receiving intensive small business development training, mentorship and support that includes grants. Water scarcity, which was characterized by inconsistent supply from boreholes, is also being addressed with the creation of a water project whose ultimate aim is to provide settlements around the reserve with purified drinking water as well as water for their livestock. Overall, operations in and around the Simkanda Game Reserve have led to the employment of over 160 members of the local community. In addition to the direct jobs that have been created, the project will also produce a net income to the community as a whole 
a portion of which will be used to catalyze and support sustainable community development projects. As South Africa's land reform debate continues to draw mixed sentiments from across the world, the Samkanda Game Reserve stands as a turning point for the Gumbi community. Joining me now is Nati Gombe. He is the founder of the Samkanda Community Game Reserve. Nati, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us. In fact, in addition to being the founder of Samkanda, you are also a prince of the Gumbi tribe. Uh, you're a direct descendant from Samkanda, and you're also getting ready to marry a princess from your neighbor tribe, uh, the Mandrakazis. With such a royal background, what prompted you to become a conservationist? Feifei, thank you very much. I used to grow under my grandfather, and my grandfather did share with me the pain story of him losing the land and under the Kumbe tribe. So when I grow, I just thought that I have to do something. Then from the new government, opened the opportunity of people who lost the right from their land to put claim. I mobilized the people, the elder and the youth, to put the claim. We submitted the claim to claim the land that we got the land back. Now, this has been quite a long journey in terms of getting your land back, developing the game reserve, and to where it is now. What are some of the key challenges that you faced along the way? The first challenge was me from the Kumbis, amongst the people who didn't understand the conservation. So people surprised, how did I come became a conservationist. So the first challenge is from your elder, your fathers, your mothers and grandfather coming with a new story which were not known, especially conservation. That was a challenge on its own. So I had to face the elder, try to convince them. Also going to community, changing the old idea or lifestyle that they had, not looking about the new challenge that is facing with the people. So I have to go straight to people. I have to think about it opening opportunity for people who are unemployed. So we're looking at a different kinds of business that we think we have to think. So we choose conservation because the land that we had was suited for conservation. This was a land that was used by the people in a traditional way for many, many generations, right? And now you've brought in a new model, and I think it's written on your shirt, share life with nature. From the way that the land was used before to this model now, the Samkonda model of sharing life with nature, what has changed? People used to hunt, people used to farm the kekli, of which was not sustainable business. It was not mean the business that was going to employ the people. So we have to change the model, try to convince the people using what the resources they had in order to survive, like employing people. That's why we have to change the, this, this kind of model, teaching people about the importance of nature, teaching people about the ecotourism, all those things. So we have to come out with a new idea and a new style of running this business. How did you do that? Fortunately, I met with the NGO which was Whitelands, was run by Dr. Andrew Fender. Those people, they came with the skills and the advice. So I was completely convinced about the nature conservation. So we started the campaign of teaching community, going location each and every village to tell the people about the importance. Because remember, this is an asset, asset of the people. We couldn't just wake up and decide. So we have to buy the ideas and the opinions of the different people. That's how we succeeded. It was a long journey and a hard journey, but it happened. You are a community activist, a conservationist, and also a tribal leader. When you think about the future, what do you envision for the Samkanda Community Game Reserve and also for your people? The vision is that I want to see the Kumbi people feel their ownership feel proud of having or with such an asset. I want to see the, the Kumbi people getting more benefit in this game reserve. And the young generation, I want to see them feel proud about the work that have been done. And I want to see us as a, as a people who were in rural areas who were undermined. But we want us, I want to see our, our community on the map, which will be well known to South Africa and to the world. Thank you, Nati. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Natchi's vision for community-based conservation is very inspiring, but on the ground, it requires a team of tireless champions, such as Pendile Ulu, who is the coordinator of community conservation for KwaZulu Natal's conservation agency. Pendili, thank you for joining us. Tell me, what exactly is the role of a community coordinator in conservation? So, as Mbelo Kezidin Wildlife is the conservation agency uh, that we are employed under, our job is to basically um, look after or manage the biodiversity within the KwaZulu Natal province. Um, our unit specifically deals with community conservation programs, which I coordinate. So, my specific program that I focus on is land claims and co management, one that basically deals with specifically. Um, communities that have basically been restituted land and often in our cases you find some of that land are reserves that were previously forcefully uh, taken away so now those are basically being taken and given back to the communities and obviously a big portion of that would be what are the tangible benefits that the communities can accrue from that so that is the one major challenge that or part of the job that we're trying to we try and figure out all the time and ensure Tell me, what is the hardest thing you've ever had to do um, in this role as the community <laughs> coordinator? Well, I wouldn't say there's one hard thing that I'd have to do, but the whole job in itself is hard. As I, as I was going on about relationship building and trust building, it's not an easy thing and it's not overnight. And often we are, we are in a sector that hasn't or has had a bad tainted image. So you're constantly trying to restore. And if you look at the prehistorics of the country, conservation has always been linked to a certain ethnic group or a smaller group of privileged people. And, you know, it's been kind of not seen as an, an African thing or a black thing. So um, our, our thoughts on that is, you know, conservation and people is dating way back and it's been practiced over time. So it's also acknowledging indigenous knowledge systems and just the knowledge from communities as well, because they've played a huge part in conservation and they've played a major role. And for most part, they have been practicing conservation since most of the communities are found in con conservation areas or largely rich biodiversity areas. What kind of resources do you need to help you in carrying out your duties? One major resource would be human resource because I think the more people doing the same work, the bigger the impact. Um, so it's, it's a capacity thing. It's better to have a large number of people working areas and communities and, you know, um, touching ground with a larger number of areas. But when you've strapped for budget sometimes and capacity of people that can help, it can be a bit of a challenge. Thank you so much for talking to us and we wish you the best of luck in your efforts to, to engage the community on your conservation journey. Thank you. Now let's take a short break. Don't go away, we'll be right back. China Global Television Network from broadcast centers in Beijing, Washington, and Nairobi. A unique global perspective. Six channels and a video content service. News when you want it and where you want it. On TV screens, websites, mobile platforms, and social media. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Joining me now to discuss conservation-based community development from inside the Samkonda Community Game Reserve, we have Mr. Oscar Matimkulu, who's the acting head of operations for the KwaZulu Natal Conservation Agency. We're also joined by Dr. Andrew Finter, who is the CEO of Wild Trust, one of South Africa's largest conservation NGOs. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us on Talk Africa. Oscar, for me, what I've seen of KwaZulu Natal, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's got beautiful landscapes, a diverse animal and plant species surrounds us. But also in this province, you have very poor rural communities. Against this context, how important is conservation? Wow, I think that's a, a very challenging question. Um, 
but basically conservation is one of the land use which you know if it's applied accordingly it should be able to benefit and assist communities especially to alleviate poverty as maybe you have noticed most of the protected areas are surrounded by a poor community so in most instances conservation as a land use is the more viable land use that could actually benefit the community so based on that i would say you know conservation land use is an appropriate land use that could be used to alleviate uh, poverty in local uh, communities and you for your organization wild trust you really are champions of conservation based community development Tell me, when I'm a member of the community, I'm needing food, I'm needing access to water, my kids need education, we need access to medical facilities. How do you sell me the concept that, no, this land, you cannot farm on it, you cannot hunt the animals, it needs to be set aside for the animals? How can you convince me of that? So the, the starting point is that it's not about setting it aside for the animals. It is land that belongs to these communities, it's their asset, and it's about working with them to help them shape a way forward. It's helping them shape a vision, working with individuals like Anati Gumbi who saw it, felt it, recognized that a decision today would affect his children's life and his grandchildren's life, because that's how these communities think in reality. But wouldn't you say Nati Gumbi is a unique scenario. By and large, a lot of people in the local communities are, if I may use the word, suspicious of the concept of conservation. They think that this is a luxury that the people cannot afford, that it is elitist, it is driven by the West, it's driven by the white man. What, what do you say to that? Well, I, I think um, communities are justified in thinking that way because uh, previously they didn't have access to protected areas. Um, they couldn't enjoy being inside the protected area, so they didn't even know how it works. They were not part of the decision-making process. But with the changes, now communities owning the land, bearing in mind that they didn't even own the land, let alone a protected area. So this has changed the whole thing in terms of the thinking because it's them now who are making a decision as to how are they going to use their own land. So I think that's where the difference is compared to where we're coming from. And I think based on that, communities will feel more comfortable because they are the ones who are making that decision. It's not the case of someone making a decision on their behalf. Tell us a little bit more about the Samkonda model. There's an aspect of the land that is being conserved. And what you've done here is developed a community-driven game reserve. What does that entail? So... So what you've got is you've got a, a trust which owns the land. The land has been returned to the trust. The trust represents the people that lost the land. That trust we've partnered with as Wild Trust. Um, and we've partnered with them. We haven't come as commercial investors. We haven't leased it. We've sat with them from the beginning and said, what we want to do is we want to work with you to help you realize your vision. Um, we have then worked with them to secure funding from government to allow for the land to be restored. This was badly overgrazed by really bad farming practice for many years. When the land was taken away from them, it was given to people who tried to do things in this land they should never have done. So we had to remove fences. We had to allow the land to recover. We had to reintroduce wildlife onto it. We had to restore some of the water facilities. So we helped the community raise the money for that. We've also helped bring in uh, donors who are fascinated about this model and want to make it work because they see the benefit of that. Our team is um, contracted by us but employed through a co-management committee and report to a co-management committee. They, they meet regularly. Um, the local trustees are on site regularly talking, guiding the process. And I need to stress this, this is a big reserve and it has, it is now what is called a big five reserve. Okay, and that was a strategic decision, controversial decision. Within the community themselves, introducing Rhino was a big step forward. And for the state, there's a whole story around Rhino. But bringing an elephant here, 
bringing in lion was almost like, what are you doing? You know, this is, these are the most scary animals on the planet, but talking them through and explaining how that will underwrite that. So those processes, but it's a high level of management. On the matter of the rhinos, um, as I understand it, the rhino population is still decreasing. It's at about 20,000 um, across Africa, but most of them are here in your province in KwaZulu-Natal. And every day, um, one or two rhinos are still being poached. What efforts are you undertaking to protect the rhinos? 20 years ago, we were dealing with this amazing success story. Rhino populations were booming and there wasn't enough space for rhino. And so new populations were being established all over. And that's how the rhino arrived here, both the white rhino and black rhino. And what's interesting about white rhino in particular is that every single white rhino, southern white rhino on the planet today, came from a population that was found in 1898 just to the south of us here in Umfalozi Game Reserve. 40 odd animals, every single one, over around about 20,000 today. So we were trying to find more space. That was what conservation was about. And it was like that until 2008. In 2008, we started losing rhino to poaching. And the first year it was 80, and then it jumped and it jumped and it jumped to the point where it peaked over the last few years where we were losing 1,100 rhino a year. And what that means is that more rhino are being poached than are being born. And so after this great success, we started seeing them decline. So this community lost their first rhino in 2010. What we then did immediately is sat with them and said, well, we've got to lift the, the security. There were no armed field rangers in the reserve. Um, so the first thing is we try to figure out how to put armed field rangers into the reserve. Then we started monitoring them and it went off for a bit. And you tell the world that you're doing this. And then in 2014, we lost four rhino in one month. Um, and at that point, we realized that unless we took a drastic decision, we would lose all the rhino in this reserve. Um, and so with the community's engagement sitting with them, we collectively took a decision that we had to dehorn rhino. Now, we were the first property in this region to dehorn rhino. And I can tell you now, at the time, just about everybody else in the conservation community thought we were wrong actually not even mad they actually judged they judged wild trust and they judged the community for dehorning those rhino and it's a brutal experience it's you take a chainsaw to the end of a rhino you see the stuff puffing and you just it's heartbreaking um, and what that has done without a doubt it is meant that that on top of very serious law enforcement this reserve is protected by a paramilitary team who are out patrolling at night watching in terms of fantastic management. But the dehorning on top of that has made the difference between the population stabilizing and starting to grow again. Oscar, Andrew has mentioned and made the point that the rhino poachers are not from the local communities. They're coming from different areas to, to carry out this heinous act. Um, but in fact, there is poaching by the local community, as I understand it. Um, on our drive through, um, they picked up dozens of snares. I, I understand them to be snares for animals. This is for people to have access to meat, a food source. Um, what do you do to address, to balance those needs for food and conservation? Um, in that case, we, we as an conservation entity, we have programs where we do, um, you know, harvest uh, wild animal for um, ecological purposes or conservation purposes. And uh, meat would be made available to the communities. Uh, but obviously, it depends on our carrying capacity. When, when we reach that carrying capacity, we do make that available. But also, I think over and above that, we are trying to create an awareness to the community that uh, those animals, they were more alive than dead because it's not only about having those available to them to eat at a time, but when they're alive, it's more sustainable for them to generate more revenue to those. But I mean, as you said, as indicated, you know, the, the communal aspect of conservation is different from a state and from a private family who run a protected area because if you look around this protected area, we're talking about millions of households living in and around that protected area. And each and every single household would want to benefit from this one single protected area. And I think that's a balance that we're trying to, to, to strike. But in, in some instances, we do have programs where we make 
uh, venison available to local communities. Now, a lot of what we've talked about comes back to an important factor, it's the economics, it's the numbers, right? So that the communities um, need the financial resources to survive and to thrive. So the Samkanda model arguably offers these financial benefits, and you've talked about the community getting jobs and access to other things, but is it enough? So at the moment it's not. Um, this reserve, some kind of reserve, costs about 500,000 US dollars to run Panam. About 150,000 of that is generated through revenue, through tourism and through hunting. And we blend the two on the reserve. So there's a gap, and it's a sizable gap, 350,000 US dollars. Um, now, that gap at the moment is filled through a combination of government support in terms of large-scale job creation programs, enabling the employment of local community members to work in the reserve, and then our network of donors who support this model and want to make it work. That can only last for a while because otherwise it's just a drain on those two sources. And so we clearly have to get the, to the point where this reserve is generating enough revenue to cover its running costs, to employ a sizable portion of the community and to put money into that community, ideally in the short term, to support social development, support better schools, um, clinics, uh, creches, and then on build on that in terms of eventually paying a dividend to the community members whose land this is, because that's the ultimate. We're just about out of time. I have one last question that I'd like to ask both of you. Is the pace of the good work that you've been doing, is it enough to meet the expectations and the demands of the community? Okay, I think to answer that, when some kind of started, it's not where it is today. It has moved from where it started to where it is. The issue of pace, I think we have to look at the pace in relation to what some kind of has achieved in terms of where we are now. The pace is always not going to be so fast. If you look at the investment, any investment portfolio, sometimes they take time. But that's where the issue is. We need to try and turn that and make sure that whereas the, the wheels are turning slowly, but there is something that is keeping the community that sustains the community. I think that's where the issue is. But also at the same time, there are dynamics. And, and dynamics are not statics. That's why it's dynamic, because they always change. But as much as they are changed, we need to look at situation to improve the situation. Andrew? Yeah, so, so I, I grew up in a society where you measure time by a clock. Time in this society is very different. Time has its own place. Things happen in their right time. Decisions that you spend a day, a month, a year, a lifetime thinking through until they write are far more robust. And so whilst I would desperately like to speed up the process at which we do things, I have learned that you have to do it at the right pace. And if you don't, it's gonna fail. And that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you once again to our guest, Mr. Oscar Mitimkulu, who's the acting head of operations for KwaZulu-Natal's conservation agency. Dr. Andrew Finter, who's the CEO of Wild Trust and all the other voices that we've heard on this show. You can keep the conversation going on our social media handles via Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. From me, Liu Feifei, and the team here inside the Samkanda Community Game Reserve in South Africa, thank you and see you next time.